Here, am I? Okay. Um, hi, yeah, I'm Agrim. I'm a PhD student here at UCSC with Professor Dinesh Bharadia, and I work with the WCSNG lab here. And today I'll be presenting our insights on how wireless uh, base station densification can actually lead to a greener uh, wireless network. So over the past decade, like our wireless networks have really matured a lot. Like using LTE, your mobile is always connected to a base station located miles away. Most often, you don't even know where this base station is located. You can't see it. It's miles away. And definitely, because of this connectivity, there's been a plethora of applications. Like uh, you have live location sharing, video streaming. Frankly, you can't even imagine your life without LTE. Like if someday you run out of the data, you'll be feeling as if you got teleported like five years back. So however, all these things have come at a huge cost to the environment. Like today, uh, the net carbon footprint of telecom industry compares to that of the aviation industry. And this that's why the industry is in heavy scrutiny to reduce the footprint. As you can see, AT&T and all are making promises to be uh, as carbon neutral as possible and as soon as possible. And however, the problem is only going to worsen. Like today, 4G uh, base stations consume about one kilowatt power, and 5G is going to make the power bills four times worse. So, why did, how did we get to this place? Like, why, why is our carbon put, footprint comparable to aviation in the first place, the industry which is carrying people's hundred, people and goods hundreds of miles away? So if you think about it, like, things are not very similar, uh, not, not very different. Uh, in, in, in telecom, you are communicating data packets to base stations which are located miles away, and at an absurd rate, you are communicating megabytes of data instantly to a base station which is located at like maybe one, one and a half miles, you can't even see it. So in a way, both these industries face what is called as the curse of distance. Like the distances involved are so huge that it requires some kind of power investment to overcome the challenges. And so what is the power investment in case of wireless networks? So really what is happening is that we are communicating via electromagnetic waves in wireless networks. And these electromagnetic waves die out due to high distance. And the power investment comes in form of the base station transmitting at very, very high power to reach, to get to the required ranges to your mobiles. And the, there's been so much effort uh, made ju just to make power amplifiers spit out at the, the required power level so that you can reach the base station. You can even see uh, something similar when you kind of turn off the mobile data in your phone and shift to Wi-Fi. Suddenly your battery improves. So, Really, the thing is that even base stations and mobiles, both are trying to maximize the range as much as possible by transmitting as high power as possible. And as a consequence of this high range, in existing deployment, like usually, this is what it looks like. There's just a single base station communicating over a geographical area and across multiple users. And there are various reasons for it, apart from the power amplifier thing, as I discussed. The capex cost of wireless networks reduce because the companies are just maintaining a single base station and just managing a single base station. However, even with all this push, often there, there are some shadow regions in the network where the signals do not uh, reach uh, to uh, nice qualities and the users face bad uh, throughput. And here the companies put a small base station, also referred to as femtocell or picocell, which basically improve the capacity by uh, serving more users robustly. So existing deployments are basically using these smaller base stations as just some site correctors to address the capacity problems. However, these small base stations can be used for something even beautiful. So what we are proposing here is that you can use these small base stations uniformly, like densify the whole network. And this densification will actually uh, save you the wireless airtime, what I refer to as. Like uh, your, all the users become closer to the base station. That way, the base station doesn't have to blast a lot of power in reaching to the users. And because of this lesser, uh, less wireless airtime, there'll be a tons of power which will be saved. So this is basically our hypothesis in this, uh, in this talk. And uh, I will prove this hypothesis in a first order argument. And the way I will go about it is first I will show how this distance uh, attenuation phenomena can be modeled in wireless transmission. And then I will tell about our uh, our approach of densifying uniformly, like replacing this one big red base station with smaller greener base stations. Then I will present a small LTE case study 
on what is the correct level to densify. You can't like just densify blindly and just go to smaller and smaller cells and then like consume more power and more deployment costs. So what is the correct point of densification? And finally, all this is definitely going to come with a lot of deployment and management challenges, which I will touch upon before I conclude. So I start with this question, how are signals attenuating with distance? So if, I, if a mobile is located at a distance of R from the base station, and this is over the air, this is something uh, it's very commonly known that the path loss associated would be like one by R square. So the base station has to transmit at the minimum received power at the mobile into some constant into R square to reach to the mobile located at a distance R. But it is not exactly this simple. When there's an urban scenario involved with so many buildings and trees and all these objects, this path loss is not exactly R square. And it is usually statistically modeled in form of uh, path loss exponent gamma. And to model these higher uh, path losses, this gamma is always greater than two. And Typically, uh, studies have showed that this gamma lies between 2.5 and 3.5. And if you take a simple example here for the rest of the talk, the base station can basically trans is transmitting instead of R square, it's transmitting in proportionality to R cube. So it is because of this R cube that densification actually makes more sense. So I compare two approaches. The one is the existing approach where there's just a single base station covering a distance of R versus four smaller green base stations covering R by two each. And as you can see that the red base station would be transmitting at something into R cube, whereas the, each of the green base station to get to the equivalent range of R by two will be transmitting at R by two cube, which is R cube by eight. Now the net power consumed in the whole deployment would basically be uh, R cube in case of the red base station, but if you even multiply the total power by four, you'll see that the total, uh, the net power consumed in the right architecture is half of the, uh, sing, uh, the power consumed by the single red base station. So from this simple toy example, you can see that at least the curse of distance is reduced to half of its level by a simple two level densification. And you can definitely generalize this to n, like basically split it to r by n, which would require n square base stations instead of like four. Like previously, it was basically n equal to two case. So here, uh, the n square green base stations will be each transmitting at r by n whole cube to cover their r by n distance. And a total of these n square base stations would basically end up consuming n square divided by n cube. So all these n square green base stations would be consuming about one nth of the power of a single red base station. But this really doesn't make sense. Like, can you just keep on splitting and uh, get to like zero power? There's like something definitely wrong in the toy examples which I have been showing. So in reality, like you, things deviate from this uh, expected one by intent. So if you, if you plot the power consumption to the densification factor, like you kind of expect this one by n trend from the toy examples which I've been showing. But if you do a case study for the LT levels of densification, which are the macro, micro, pico, and femto levels, you'll see that the gains start to flatten out after a certain point. So this happens because it's not just the transmit power which is involved in the base stations. There's a fixed cost of just operating the base station. And because of this fixed cost, the trend deviates. And this fixed cost shows up in various tasks like RF circuits consumption or the basement processing. And these fixed costs basically start growing as N square when you densify more. So really the net trend, the blue trend is the sum of these two, uh, two trends, which is the dying one by N trend as I explained in the two examples and the increasing N square trend, which comes because of the fixed cost. So because of this, there is a green point of operation like you can't go to something even beyond femto. You have to like really limit yourself and work in the regime where densification is giving you enough power savings to, to save the transmit power, but not, not exacerbating your fixed cost as a consequence of densification. So to get to these curves, basically we take the power consumption of one base stations and basically multiply it by the number of base stations required to fill in the macro, uh, macro area. And these calculations are more detailed in the paper. You can take a look at them. And uh, 
the bottom line is that like this is today like this is this is the curve of today but th th there are definitely a lot of innovations going around so first innovation could be that you simply reduce this fixed cost basically you have even efficient power amplifiers or efficient rf circuits what this will do is it will reduce your uh, uh, reduce your growing factor the second thing which you can do is which ties in well with the previous talk basically do a softwareized control of these dense base station basically if there is no user in a dense base station area just turn it off that will basically reduce your n so overall future trend could be that uh, the costs are reduced like either the n is reduced or the component itself is reduced and this can shift the densification curve to right and bottom which would lead to higher power savings as well as more densification levels but uh, with more densification levels really the question becomes that who is going to set up these hundreds of base station because the definitely mobile networks have vested interest they just want to maintain a single base station at a high power and here really the uh, challenges could be overcome if we incentivize the communities to set up base stations for example like there is this helium network for lora base stations where people are getting incentivized to maintain a lora base station and support the iot deployment something similar can be done for cellular networks in fact if you do a quick search on alibaba you can even buy a personal base station for about 1500 dollars which is about the same cost as a flagship uh, smartphone so it's like uh, around the horizon and there are some startups doing something similar for wifi like there's this link nyc which is uh, uh, incentivizing roadside shop owners to Uh, own a Wi-Fi hotspot, and basically the shops get some money back in form of how much data their customers use. And there's something similar even in India in the city of Bangalore, where this company called Wi-Fi Dabba. So basically, it's like the trend is already there. Like if startups and all are involved, they can basically engage the communities, and these base stations can be really set up. But then, who is going to orchestrate this big network? Like definitely, this network is not just the base stations, but also the wired network as we i think saw in the previous two talks and this wired network has to be also managed in a sustainable and a carbon uh, carbon efficient way some ideas here could be that because these smaller base stations really are lower powered and are serving lesser users than a typical lte base station can you just use the existing laid telecom cables like for the wired telephony which are not being used and economically not feasible to dig out and remove so can can these be repurposed and used for the smaller base stations then really can you make these smaller base stations to be interoperable so that different vendors can come and innovate at different levels levels which are consistent with this oran stack up and finally can you do some kind of hardware reuse basically not have complicated base station designs and use the previous 3g base stations or upgrade your wifi access points to act as smaller base stations and use some old cpus and smartphones of our compute i think this has been like mentioned in various talks i i, I won't go in much detail but yeah so to conclude what we are envisioning is that uh, by densifying uniformly you will end up reducing the net air time of the wireless signals which will defeat the curse of distance in a big way however you have to take care that this curse of distance doesn't become curse of numbers just because you are simply operating hundreds of base station at a given fixed cost so there's a densification green point which the networks network managers really need to realize and finally the def, there are some deployment and management challenges of these uniform dense networks and this would require some kind of incentivization from the communities so yeah i would conclude with that and i'm open for any questions thank you questions i think there was there was Thank you for the nice talk. So my question is, have you looked at the embodied cost of building uh, multiple small base stations versus a big powerful one? And could there be a embodied carbon cost trade-off there? So uh, I'll repeat the question for audience sake. So no, the, no, no, they can hear. OK, they can hear? OK, yeah. OK, OK. So, um, uh, so the. Uh, so there are really two components to the carbon footprint right there's the operational part and there's the embedded cost so what i've shown in the talk is the operational part will reduce significantly just because of saving on the wireless air time 
Now coming to the embedded cost that you are having multiple of these base stations scattered around and instead of a big complicated base station. So definitely it will involve a higher embedded cost. Like there's no doubt in that. But if you are able to repurpose the older base stations, like anyways, the 3G base stations and all cannot act as today's 5G base stations. So if we can repurpose these Wi-Fi APs which we are throwing, the legacy Wi-Fi APs, the legacy base stations, it will in a way reuse the hardware and cover this embedded cost and make the whole idea sustainable. Andrew Chen, U Chicago. So I really like the story because um, obviously wireless power is a huge problem. Access network power is a huge problem. But I'm having sort of cognitive dissonance trying to understand this. And I'm wondering if maybe the answer is it has something to do uh, that the dynamics different around license spectrum or unlicensed spectrum or something like that. Because the way I perceive what's going on with 5G is they're building much smaller cells and the telecom industry's reaction to much smaller cells is to turn the power up and try and cram as many bits through as possible. So I'm wondering in this scheme, why wouldn't the network operators be incentivized to just crank up the power of all of those transmitters to be equal to the power of the, of the sparser network? So and, and that, cram more bits through the network. Yeah, so basically, okay, uh, in, in terms of wireless networks, what happens is when you are cranking the power up, you can use like very high level constellations and get simply more bits out of your transmission, all right? So, now what is, uh, if, if, you are, if you are densifying your deployment, firstly what will happen is your load will decrease. Like the, you are not supporting these hundreds of users. You have to just support two, three users in a more efficient way. So there actually it would be much more efficient to blast a lot of power and get the users at a high throughput and just reduce the energy in that way. Even though your power will be high, your net throughput of the link will reduce. So a lot of savings are actually going to come just because the contention of the users will decrease if you're densifying more. And because the path loss of your signals have decreased, just to get to that same level of received power at the mobile, you don't need to blast that much power. Or if you're blasting that much power, you can just get a very high throughput link and like quickly finish up the data uh, transmission. And in a way, either you save energy, like it, energy is basically something which will end up being saved. Even if the transmit powers are cranked up, like it will be used for a lesser time per user. So that's super interesting. So you're basically arguing that you could have a higher bandwidth density per square meter or something like that delivered at a lower average power. Yeah, but then it ties in well with the previous talk. Like then the networks need, really need to sleep when it's not required. Like quickly finish up the data requirements and then go in a sleep mode. If you are keep on, keeping on blindly blasting that much power, that will be inefficient. Okay, so one last, sorry, do you have a question? Okay, uh, I'll ask the question on, on, on uh, Zoom here. Uh, so Matt Johnson asked the question, um, did you consider only standalone base stations with integrated broadband pa processing or have you considered in your model the work being done by Open RAN to disaggregate the processing from the actual transmission hardware? Uh, no, I've considered the standalone uh, operations because that was the only data which was available. Like, and this data is actually like about uh, eight years old, so it's only for LTE. For 5G, uh, as I'm predicting, like with open RAN so things and all, like your densification curve will definitely, it's going in this trend. So it, it might be like uh, more feasible to do femtocells in 5G than in LTE. All right, so I have a comment and a question. So first, I just want to comment because everybody kind of laughed when that helium thing popped up there. I want to make the point that this thing is actually very real. They have about 900,000 LoRa base stations currently deployed. If you are in a large metro area, you probably already have good LoRa coverage. In fact, I have deployed several networks in San Diego myself on top of this. They also already have 5G nodes. There are two on this campus. Uh, so this is not just like a joke blockchain -y thing. It's very real and it's a, like the idea of getting people to deploy your network it's done, it's there, it exists. All that uh, aside, what I wanted to ask you about was what I didn't see on that slide, which was a nice comparison of uh, cell size and power and everything else, was where Wi-Fi fits into the picture. And at the end of the day, you said at the beginning, you know, Wi-Fi is lower power for your phone to use. And at some point in time, as you push things smaller, you're gonna have duplication of infrastructure. 
And even as you push things smaller, you also have the weird problem of your phone communicating over different ranges. In particular, one of the things that makes cellular fairly inefficient is the high dynamic range it has to achieve to do very long or shorter range communication. So are there opportunities in this space of more nuanced infrastructure instead of just trying to stamp out cell at every single distance level as the right way to do the networking problem? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, like uh, I was also thinking about it because if you see the power consumption of a Wi-Fi access point is about uh, six to nine watts, and a femtocell is ten watts. So femtocell really is a Wi-Fi AP, which is instead of doing Wi-Fi modulation, it's doing LTE or something. So if you and at the end of the day, you really want something which is connected to a wired backbone. So what my uh, hypothesis is that you reduce your air uh, wireless air travel time. So if you are getting connected with a, something which over Wi-Fi to a wired backbone, yeah, might as well use it. In fact, it's really there. You can enable Wi-Fi calling in your phones. You can see the difference. Like it's more reliable and your phone is saving battery. So it's happening. But this maybe requires more from the Mac side of things, like how, how the network can basically detect that, OK, this is the Wi-Fi transmission really, but it is LTE, like what Wi-Fi calling is doing, but really push to the next level where even data and all can be done in this way. And yeah, this is an interesting thought. Like femtocell and Wi-Fi, in my view, are same power level. So they will fit into the same equation almost similarly. So yeah, we, maybe some innovations from the networking side to uh, detect and do, do these things, do a universal uh, receiver, that might be like really interesting going ahead. Okay, um, so, uh, so thanks again for the speaker. Thank Can you. you turn your mic off? Uh,